The federal government has threatened to declare a state of emergency in Anambra to ensure that the November 6th governorship election in the state takes place. Speaking to reporters after the Federal Executive Council meeting, Attorney General and Minister of Justice Abubakar Mahal Amisa's government is determined to ensure a hitch-free election in Anambra state despite the wave of attacks and killings. The minister says the federal government would ensure that security is provided for the exercise. When our national security is attacked and the sanctity of our constitutionally guaranteed democracy is threatened, no possibility is ruled out. As a government, we have a responsibility to ensure the sustenance of our democratic order. As a government, we have a responsibility to provide security to lives and properties. So within the context of these constitutional obligations of the government and the desire to establish democratic norms and order, there is no possibility that is outruled. The government will certainly do the needful in terms of ensuring that our elections are held in Anambra, in terms of ensuring necessary security is provided, and in terms of ensuring protection is accorded to lives and properties. So what I'm saying in essence, no possibility is outruled by government in terms of ensuring the sanctity of our democratic order, in terms of ensuring that our elections in Anambra holds. And you cannot out all possibilities inclusive of the possibility of declaration of state of emergency where it is established in essence that there is failure on the part of the state government to ensure the sanctity of security of lives, properties, and democratic order. So our position as a government is if these elections are going to hold unnecessary uh, security in terms of uh, uh, democratic order must certainly prevail for the purpose of this election. On the economic front, how can we celebrate? And in a swift reaction, and in a swift reaction, the People's Democratic Party asked the federal government to bury the thoughts of imposing a state of emergency in Anambra state ahead of November 6th governorship election. In a statement, National Publicity Secretary of the party, Kuala Lubudinyan, accuses the ruling All Progressive Con Congress of plots to suppress the people, manipulate the process, and rig the governorship election for APC and its candidates. He demands that the APC and its administration should come clean on their roles in the sudden rise of insecurity in Anambra State ahead of the election. The PDP insists that the federal government has the capacity to ensure peace in Anambra State before, during, and even after the elections. All right, Tundu, dive in. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is getting funny and scary by the day. Yes, it's a real shame. Yesterday, I was reading Kayode Komolafe's piece on the back page of this day, why the Anambra elections must hold. And he really laid down the issues really well. But this morning's news is now things have been ratcheted up a notch. Mm. And this protest by the PDP is amusing to me. Mm. Obviously, it can't be dismissed. The fears um, being expressed are legitimate. But it's amusing to me because if we're going to be partisan about it, the person who sowed the seeds of the suspicion that the PDP is expressing now was the PDP um, former president, Olusegun Obasanjo. When in 2004, his state of emergency that he declared in Plato State involved him suspending an elected governor and elected state House of Assembly members, which is a travesty in a democracy. This is exactly why PDP is now suspicious that this is what uh, President Muhammadu Buhari's administration is trying to do. But the facts, or should I say historical evidence, does not support that. What President Muhammadu Buhari has done in the past, that's also unconstitutional, I might add, which I must stress is why we should rethink having former generals as presidents in the first case. He has declared states of emergency in northern states like Borno, Yobe, um, Adamawa, Katsina, Kaduna since um, 2015 mm. and without seeking approval of the National Assembly just went ahead and did it. That too is unconstitutional but I would argue to a lesser degree as from what um, President Obasanjo did. Mm. And it's just what is the state of emergency in the first case? Section 305 of the Constitution states very clearly the parameters under which it can reasonably be called. Mm. 
in the event of a war or threat of a war or a breakdown in order and public safety and what have you. And it can only be sustained by a two thirds majority mm. in the House of Assembly, in the House of Reps and the Senate within two days of being published in the Gazette or 10 days if the National Assembly is on recess. So it's not, I feel, out of order for the president to want to call a state of emergency to maintain public order, if that is the case. And also, if there's a threat to the existence of the Federation, that's also one of the um, prerequisites in Section 305. What would be unconstitutional is if he then decides to remove a governor or remove a state house of assembly, which has not been mooted at this time. Because President Sebastian did it in 2004 does not mean that's going to be the case now. I mean, even when we had our first state of emergency in Nigeria in 1962, mm. it's because of the crisis in the Western region yes. that happened there. So it does tend to be something that's only supposed to be used in a case of dire emergency. We all hope that the Anambra state situation does not deteriorate to that, but it's just for me something that's on the table as an option. Okay, yes. The relevant sections of the Constitution are as follows. Section 4, Section 11, Section 305. And Section 305 talks about a specific request uh, from, to the uh, President of the Federation uh, in the light of some of those conditions listed in section, uh, section 305. If there is war, if there is imminent public uh, breakdown of public or another, if, if there is a threat to the sovereignty of Nigeria. Has there been a request to the president of Nigeria for a suspension of the existing order in uh, Anambra State? If there's no time, let's go on break. When Emmanuel Efeni comes, maybe I'll have time to make further comments. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News, where we're still discussing the proposal to impose a state of emergency on Anambra State. And before we went on break, I was making the point that the relevant sections of the uh, Constitution are as follows. Section 4, Section 11, Section 305. Under Section 305, there are specific conditions under the Constitution when the President of Nigeria can declare a state of emergency. It includes when there is war, breakdown of law, law and order. But there's a subsection, I think subsection 4, where there will be a specific request to the uh, president of Nigeria uh, to intervene and for the National Assembly to intervene. So it's not as if it's something that anybody can do unilaterally. However, the que first question to ask is, is there a breakdown of law and order in Anambra State? Given the spate of uh, assassinations, assault on public institutions, the disruption of the constructive legal order in that state, you may say, yes, there is a crisis. And this is not the first time we'll be faced with that. In the Western region, as you referred to earlier, 1964, uh, when uh, Dume was made uh, uh, governor in the, uh, in the Western uh, region, sole administrator, he was called at the time. Then we had under President Olusha in 2004, the situation in Plateau State, when Joshua Dariye uh, was removed. Uh, unilaterally, more or less, uh, by the president of Nigeria. And then in Ekiti, when Ayofayoshi, uh, then governor, during his first term as uh, governor of Ekiti state, was chased out of the state, Nicodemusle. Now, one or two of these matters were determined at the Supreme Court. And it was established that the uh, Obasanjo intervention with the, uh, you know, with the attempt to invoke Section 305 run against the grain of the spirit and letter of the Constitution. And that cannot be used as a precedent. And it's on that basis that, you know, subsequent governments should be guided. So when you had under President uh, Goodluck Jonathan, Good Luck, uh, President Goodluck Jonathan faced with terrorism, uh, Boko Haram threats in Boronu State and Yobe State, decided you know, based on uh, the advice of the Office of the Attorney General, to suspend certain local governments in Yobe and uh, Borono states. He did not remove the governor, as the Obasanjo administration did. Because there's nowhere in the Constitution that the Constitution of Nigeria says the president of Nigeria can unilaterally remove a sitting governor. And I hope in this particular case in Anambra, yes, if it can be proven, as we all agree, that there is a breakdown of law and order. What next? Anambra is in a situation whereby 
There is, uh, you know, an election scheduled uh, for November 7. INEC has said that his staff, his uh, facilities are under threat and that what they need is security. And I think it's on the basis of that that the federal government is now saying we're considering the declaration of a state of emergency. That declaration of a state of emergency is not the only option. The election can be suspended. The election can be postponed. There is a provision in the Constitution that says you can postpone an election for six months. If after six months the situation is still not okay, you can have the Speaker of the House of Assembly taking over for another six months. Okay, if within one year, you know, the Constitution does not go that far, because in the contemplation of the uh, authors of the uh, Constitution, it is assumed that within that period of time, whatever crisis, whatever breakdown of law and order existing in any particular state would have been addressed. The big issue that the Buhari administration faces, I guess they've uh, focused on the declaration of state of emergency in order to generate uh, a debate. Now, the constitution of Nigeria does not encourage or allow the, the unilateral removal of a sitting governor. So even if they take the option of a state of emergency, they cannot remove the governor of uh, Anambra State, Obiano. That will be a violation of the constitution. That will be a violation of uh, stare decisis. That is the existing position of the law on the matter. So that is one area that they have to be careful about. The only option that is available is that, look, if a governor is removed, if the state house of assembly is suspended, uh, within the purview of Section 4 of the Constitution, then the House of Representatives is empowered to make law for that affected state. But what does this say to us in general terms? It is simply that, look, there's crisis in Anambra State, as there is crisis in other parts of the uh, Southeast, and the federal government is trying to intervene to ensure security. The whole purpose of a declaration of state of emergency is to ensure security. And if you say the governor of the state is the chief security officer, are these governors in their various states, are they empowered? Are they in a position, whether there is a breakdown of law and order, to ensure security? So what we're seeing playing out around the conversation about Anambra is also the fault lines about mm. Nigeria. Mm. How our states are fragile, how the Nigerian states itself is fragile. But whoever is involved from the office of the attorney general down to the uh, uh, stakeholders in Anambra State, they should be well apprised of the position of the law in this matter and the kind of ugliness that we witnessed in the past, you know, when uh, the law was circumvented and what we saw was the uh, dictatorship of the presidency. I hope that nobody will advise uh, President Buhari, even in trying to hold the peace and ensure the security of the people and uh, property in Anambra State to circumvent the law and violate the law, because there will be persons, stakeholders, who will be prepared to go to court and remind everyone of the best way to declare a state of emergency. The other narrative coming out is about the fact that why is it now in Anambra State when you have other states with big crises and problems? We have problems in Kaduna. The argument is, yes, the Kaduna crisis isn't the time to declare a state of emergency, to step in. We have crisis in Borno that led to, you know, suspending telecommunication, which for me is a war measure. We had crisis in other parts of the North. Why has this not been done? I mean, that's just another narrative I'm looking at. Because, you see, a lot of people are saying, when we want to come to equity, let's come to equity. With clean hands. With clean hands. Sweet, sweet. So across board, those other places we have crisis of tremendous proportion, I should say, in the north and some other areas like that. We've not heard anything about state of emergency. And now the attorney general, the only idea he's been able to mute out is state of emergency. I mean, because a lot of people are arguing that what INEC even requested for was improved security. And they've changed police commissioners. I mean, we're talking about yesterday, about the last police commissioner just spent only one month. Yeah. They've changed another one. They can improve security. We, we've seen deployment of massive police presence in individual elections. I think the last security election was over 30,000 police officers. They could bolster security and to keep Kogi, the peace. Kogi as well. And Kogi. But why 
it even getting to the point of a stage of emergency. And some other people too will argue that leading up to the 2019 elections, INEC did come out. Their properties were attacked in Akwa Ibom. Facilities were burnt in other parts. Why didn't they declare a state of emergency then? Well, I'm not willing to dismiss that argument that you've advanced. That's also something to consider. But my point will always remain just the fragility and the value of a democracy and entrusting it into the hands of retired generals who mm. will resort to the tools of the military to quell issues. This is what we have gotten. And I must repeat PDP's fears. This is the danger of precedent. What they are worried about was introduced into the Fourth Republic mm -hmm. by President Obasanjo, who is also from PDP. So how's that for irony? Yes. Well, but at the point to note, I, I get the point that government should not cherry pick there must be a rules-based intervention, yes. Yes. you know, in terms of how you govern and how you articulate uh, policies. But the thing to also note is that in security circles, what they consider first is the threat level. What is the threat level? Okay, so the question you will now ask from the point you have raised, is the threat level in Anambra higher than the threat level in Zamfara or the threat level in Borono State? You know, so all of these issues can't be raised by persons. But unfortunately, the people who are the professionals, you know, they will say they have information that you are not privy to, mm. either in their blue paper or some other papers that they use to report directly to the president. And it's on the basis of the assessment of the security threat level that certain decisions will be taken. I also imagine that the Office of the Attorney General, you know, coming up with this possibility. He's also probably trying to test public opinion. Mm. I keep saying public opinion is an important part of, uh, you know, uh, government uh, policy process. But clearly, from what we have seen, without having the details, you know, there's problem in Anambra. And government needs to do something to build confidence, mm. to build trust in the uh, electoral process, and to ensure the integrity of the electoral process in Anambra, because it could have far-reaching implications mm. for the 2023 general elections. Mm. Whether it's in a, what's that your village again? Uh, whether it's in a, uh, Abelkuta. where's that? Abelkuta. 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 Yeah, not from Abelkuta. <laughs> whether it's in Odobulu or in Asaba. Abelkuta is not a village. <laughs> or it's in Asaba, which we discussed uh, yesterday. So, you know, I, I can't, I can't uh, quibble to remember Abelkuta. <laughs> <laughs> That's the town that has given you all the <laughs> major president. But I mean, talking seriously, yeah. the main point is that, look, security is a major part yeah. of the electoral process. And an Amra election, November 6, is a little bit more test, mm. both for the uh, uh, Buhari administration and also for INEC. Mm. INEC has said, we can do it if you give us security. Or an Aze Indigo has said, look, the election can take place uh, if, you, if you allow the people to go out to vote. But would they be able to pull it off? Mm. Very important that they pull it off. It is. And that they ensure the security and the integrity of the vote. Yes. Big question. Would they be able to pull it off like Dr. Bati said? But the most important thing is, all we are saying, let's give peace a chance in this country. Peace is necessary for development. All right, that's all on News Headline. We'll take a short break. When we return, we have Michael Wilson, Adesua Morwa, and Aaron Akirjala to give updates on global business, COVID-19, spotting activities across the globe. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Morning Show here on Arise News. And now for a global business update, Michael Wilson joins us from London. Good morning, Mr. Wilson. Good morning. Uh, it's still a bit of a roller coaster week, really. And as I said yesterday, nothing's going to change much about that. Chasing very, very thin data. Big news stories, which I'll come on to. But basically, everything as far as the market's concerned, looking forward to the non farm payrolls um, in the United States tomorrow lunchtime. Everything will pause and we'll get a lot more idea about direction. Asia Pacific markets. Um, the US rally, which uh, again, I'll come on to, uh, continued uh, in Asia. Um, you know, China close and so on. We know that. Uh, Nikkei up uh, about 1%. Cosby, uh, um, about one and a half percent, um, but mainland China, as I said, um, closed. Hong Kong stocks, though, up as well because the government apparently is going to build 90,000 new homes, and that's pushed things up. That's been uh, received positively. Hang Seng up over 2% today. In the United States, then, we need to talk about um, Mitch McConnell, who's the Republican leader in the Senate. Now, what he's been 
proffering uh, is an extension to the debt ceiling discussions, which um, will, will be the United States is concerned if it were to happen. They're talking a lot about reconciliation and so on. I believe it when I see it quite honestly, given the margins are so thin. This looks like to me to kicking the can. Uh, down the road. and But even so, the markets took that relatively positively yesterday. NASDAQ up about half a percent. Dow Jones uh, ending about a third of a percent higher yesterday. China talks. Now they are on, apparently, according to sources. This is going to be a virtual summit between Joe Biden and um, and, and, the, and the Chinese president, they've reached an agreement in principle for a virtual a virtual bilateral meeting, uh, a part of an, uh, uh, an attempt to manage trade and also competition between countries. Let's move on to Facebook. And as we've been talking about all week, it's getting slammed on all sides now, it's showing some major cracks, actually. This is the company's roughest stretch for the Years. We talked about the Facebook files yesterday and politicians from both sides are getting really cross now with Facebook because it looks that when you go through these internal documents that were released by the whistleblower Francis Haugen, it revealed that Facebook has long known from its own research, this is what's really annoying people, that a severe harm its apps can actually cause. Um, there's 209 uh, slides of internal company research, loads of documents still to come. Um, now, as far as Russia is concerned, this is the big one here. President Putin has offered to stabilize um, the oil, the, the energy crisis, sparked a 10 year sell off in prices, 10 percent rather sell off in prices in natural gas yesterday. Um, he also mentioned the business about certifying the Nord Stream, um, Nord Stream gas pipeline too, as a potential solution to Europe's uh, gas energy woes. Um, I have to be said that uh, they're very high on the very high on rhetoric, as most politicians are pretty low on, on detail. Um, the worry is, of course, that once you've signed to Russia, then you've signed to Russia. And that's what's holding a lot of European countries back, including the European Union, which, according to its uh, energy uh, chair, Kadri Simpson, has said that uh, the gas price hitting consumers, there is no power at all for quick fixes, and that includes no power to cut energy taxes, no power to alter regulatory changes, which some member states are actually blaming of exacerbating the energy crisis. Which brings us to the UK, and households have been warned of a, get this, 30% rise in energy bills over over the winter. The cap would be put on at £16.60 a year, uh, which is a lot higher than it is at the moment. And even the chairman of National Grid has said that things are going to be very tough over the winter. Um, as far as the Prime Minister here is concerned in the UK, he's admitted a uh, big speech yesterday to the Conservative Party conference closing it rich on bombast and rhetoric, its critics have said. Um, he's saying that uh, a lot of people actually voted for this kind of difficulty when they voted for Brexit in 2016 and the general election in 2019. I don't think they did. I think people just voted and they, they, they knew what the detail would actually be. And business is now complaining it's being used as a sponge to soak up the extra costs coming from these increased energy costs and so on. And Finally, uh, a, a vote on Brexit from Intel, rather against it. Intel is not going now to build a factory uh, in the UK. It's no longer considering, as it said, if it stayed in Europe, then they would have done. Intel wants to boost its output, obviously, given the, given the, 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 the shortage of and it's one of the world's largest makers of semiconductors, so it's clear that they want to do something, but apparently they're not going to do it in Britain. OK, just briefly on commodities then, oil prices have fallen uh, on that news from Russia, as I said. Uh, again, nothing to do with oil, but more to do with natural gas. But oil, as I said, has been an accidental passenger to those sort of things all week. Um, and also U.S. inventories showed a huge jump as well, much more than people expected. And gold remains sidelined. Interesting observation about gold from the markets this morning. Yes, it is sidelined. It's not moving, but it does show that people are beginning to think about risk again. Um, and they're keeping the price uh, relatively supported. That's the global view. All right, Michael. Uh, thank you so much for the insight. Let me start with Boris Johnson's speech yesterday. You know, for me, I heard the speech that came out of Manchester, and it was just a lecture on how to say nothing with so many words. Because <laughs> he, all the things he said were, goodness me, only God understands how he thinks. The UK has failed. His government has failed on all the deliverables. Look at energy. Look at the crisis. Look at the massive crisis that is happening, even with oil, 
petrol, supply chain, everything, Intel pulling out of the UK. And the fact that even some Tory members are complaining now that the party has lost his soul because he's looking for solutions, he tries to become like the Labour Party now. Somebody went to the conference with a banner or with a tag on his shirt or with his, on his coat called Tory scum. And that's how bad things have become. How will he salvage himself out of this debilitating state of the UK economy as it is today? And secondly, the bubble of Evergrande has started to bust. Evergrande has started to sell and strip most of its assets all over the world. I keep making the point of Credit Suisse guaranteeing some of the Evergrande bond. When will this fire come into Europe? Let's talk about uh, Johnson first of all. Yes, I think these critics would agree, and I think most observers did. It was very short on detail and long on rhetoric and bombast, as I as I said. The point about Tory scum is <clears throat> actually what that'll be. Uh, it's uh, I mean this this is what Labour Labour think at the moment. I wouldn't personally walk around with a little badge on my lapel saying Tory scum. I wouldn't go around with any badges at all. But some people feel it's absolutely necessary. You're going to get um, you're going to get things like that in a democracy. That's what it's what people think. Sure, I don't think it says. A great deal it's just a sort of childish uh, a childish comment but the truth is that what's actually happening is a worldwide problem i mean johnson was sh very short on detail but he is a politician but it doesn't take doesn't take a big brain to understand what's actually going on it is to do with brexit certainly because we're not part of the eu anymore we haven't heard anything about the eu's growing pains yet because they've just got over big election um, of a leader a leadership election in Germany. We will be hearing more about the EU and its problems as that goes on. But let's leave that to a side for a moment. What's actually happening is big, big things are getting into play at the moment. Russia is holding out this olive branch at the sun, but China is buying up energy like there's no tomorrow because they are going through a massive energy crisis as well. So these huge tectonic plates, which, which impact the, the granular detail of these tectonic plates, it's the bits of rubble that come off it include problems with supply chains not excusing what's happened of course politicians need to protect these kind of things but if you want to protect them you've got to you've got to pay for them so as i keep saying if you want in case you can have in case if you want in time then you have in time at the moment we've, we've existed as most economies do on in time production or on time production i.e there's not a lot of slack in the supply chain that's a change we're all going to go to have and this is why bring back to johnson again that that business was complaining to him and is complaining to him today saying that you expect us to soak up the costs of all this well they do but that internal debate the fact of the matter is it's international matters of, of energy which are uh, energy crisis which are actually causing these things we've seen the natural gas price how much is it is it 10 times more than it was it is yes a tenfold increase on where it was at the beginning of the year that's not just a, a british a uk problem it's a worldwide problem that's that's what's happening so we're seeing these 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 spikes, these these huge up, uplifts in supply chain problems and inflation, the rest of it. Now, the wiser amongst us, um, I'm not including, I'm just saying that there the, the, the ought to be people thinking about this, is the age-old question we've often talked about before. Is it is it is it just for now, and is the long-term outlook, outlook less like that, or is it is, is this a permanent increase in inflation? Where are we in the cycle? What, what, are, what are the main answers to those questions? I don't know the answer. I don't think many people do. But it's down. But as soon as central banks start to move on this, and that's why we'll be looking very closely at the US jobless figures tomorrow, we'll get an idea of where the, the world economy is actually going. Well, still on now, Johnson, uh, Mr. Wilson. I like your specific opinions on that speech at the Tory conference yesterday. Uh, radical con conservatism, we were told Boris Johnson was pushing. But pro-Brexit pro industry leaders are saying that it was empty, it was economically illiterate, and that the Prime Minister is blaming everybody else uh, for the uh, faults of the government. They, they say it's short on policies. But even in terms of policies, he made the point, yes, there may be increased prices, inflation may go up, but all of that will be transitory. Is he right on that score? Uh, considering the fact that even Nestle is saying that uh, children will not be able to eat lion bars, Kit Kat, you know, uh, at Christmas. And farmers are saying they will have to call over 100,000 pigs uh, because of the supply chain issues. 
which the Prime Minister uh, makes light of, even if he's been accused of a throwback to Thatcher and uh, Winston uh, Churchill. What do you think that the Prime Minister is trying to do, even on immigration? He says, look, UK workers will get more money if uh, we do not revise uh, our immigration policy to allow outsiders uh, to come in. And these are issues we've been dealing with uh, on this program. Do you think that Boris Johnson can fix Christmas and fix Britain? OK. Um Christmas will not be fixed by politicians. Christmas will be fixed by business. And if kids can't have lion bars, well, you know, hard luck. Because there's a lot of chocolate in there and children tend to be too fat. Uh, some are, some aren't. But lion bars are not, are not the issue. That's, a, that's a, a, an interesting thing that people can, can put in their minds and, and think about. It's not that that isn't the issue at all. It's what I've been saying. It's whether well, or not. Food supply, what is, an seeing, issue. Food supply is an issue, <laughs> isn't it? What? Food well, supply. lion bars are not an issue. No, lion bars are little, <laughs> little sweetie bars that you buy in a supermarket. If kids can't have those, then hard luck is what I'm saying. Oh you know, you get over Mr. it. M move on. You know, we went, we've, we've been through lots of shortages before, and lion bars are basically not an issue that I would be particularly worried about. What worries me is the long-term effects I've just been talking about. It's not that politicians won't save it. Johnson's talk yesterday was a politician's talk. As I say, it was empty. It was empty on detail, and it was long on rhetoric, and it was long on bombast. And it, I, I mean, it, he, he may well be, I don't think he himself is, is comparing himself to, to Margaret Thatcher. He's calling upon these people to say, this is how they dealt with the kind of policies. I can tell you, in 1979, when she came to power and she put her arms around people like Milton Friedman, who said there's too much inflation um, in, in this economy, and it took her probably five or six years to get to the state where there was li very little inflation. Inflation was running at 22 percent in our country then. My mortgage cost me an average interest rate of 24 uh, percent when I, when I was buying a house to start with. So I know all about the the, what, what happened in the past. It, but it's, no, it's never down to politicians to fix these kind of things. They just won't. Johnson won't fix it. It'll be down to business. Business will have to come to terms with the fact that we all will need to pay higher prices. It's as simple as that. That's, that's, that's all it is. You know, and what we've seen is it's a political conference. I mean, that's what politicians do. I'm saying that the, the basic bottom line is we will all find life much more expensive, whether we like it or not. Well, I thought you were going to round off with a bar humbug because you are sounding like Ebenezer Scrooge there about the children being deprived of their favorite chocolates. But on Boris Johnson, I think that's all everybody's got on their minds this morning. He reminded me that speech of his appearances on Have I Got News For You? Mm. And that's not a flattering thing for me to say. I mean, it was all very well and good. I rather enjoyed him on that show. But as the Prime Minister of the UK, after his speech, I was thinking, is the real Prime Minister going to come out and address the country like an adult? Because really, all style and no substance there. But that's just my comment on it. Yeah. Not a question, yeah. just a comment. Pretty much replica of uh, some of his articles, right, anyway. Thank you so much, Michael. Really appreciate you for your time. Uh, for updates on COVID-19 pandemic, Adesua Mora is here with us. Good morning, guys. Indeed, Prime Minister Boris Johnson does know how to make jokes out of situation, but it's no jokes this morning on the COVID-19 update as Mexico, Brazil, Russia, some of the few countries turning, churning out COVID-19 deaths in the hundreds. Unfortunately, so far, uh, over 4.82 million people have now died from the virus globally, and uh, over 236 million people have been infected so far in countries and territories around the world. And as more countries prepare to reopen or open international travel this winter and ahead of the holiday, governments are hoping that vaccine mandates and vaccine certificates would help prevent large-scale infection spread. 6.3 billion doses of vaccines have now been administered globally. And just moments ago, before I came on air, Moderna has announced 
announced it will invest $500 million to build a state-of-the-art factory in Africa. It says this will help produce 500 million doses of vaccines yearly. It also says there will be no transfer of intellectual property, but the facility will be staffed by local workers. Uh, hopefully, that would help boost vaccine supply on the continent. However, no proposals for location or a start date has been mentioned in the statement. It joins the likes of Pfizer, who are already in partnership with some governments on the African continent to produce vaccines on the continent for the continent, hopefully. Well, here in Nigeria, the FCT posted 104 of the 297 infections reported by the NCDC. According to the data, the 104 cases coming out from the FCT and the 14 cases coming from Kano State uh, are backlog of data. However, Lagos State posted 40 new infections in the last 24-hour period in Nigeria. The NCDC is also reporting nine COVID-19-related deaths in Nigeria in the last 24 hours. And speaking of Lagos, the Commissioner for Health has been given an update on the virus situation in the country's epicenter. Professor Aki Abayami says as at October 3rd, Lagos has so far conducted a little above 759,000 tests. And I can tell you that that's more than one quarter of all sample tested in the country. Nigeria has so far tested a little above 3 million samples. Now, of these samples tested in Lagos, 76,928 have returned positive. Unfortunately, Lagos State has lost 649 fatalities to the virus officially reported. At the moment, Professor King Abayami says there are 136 positive cases at isolation centers across the state, and there are also 916 active cases in the community. You recall that Lagos, during the second wave, adopted the home-based uh, treatment strategy with its eco telemed to monitor people from their homes. So that's the picture, current picture uh, for Lagos, according to the Commissioner for Health, which is right there on your screen. Uh, although he did not mention the update on the vaccination exercise in the state, the NPHCDA latest data shows that over 5 million eligible Nigerians targeted for vaccination have now received the first dose in the country while 2.2 million have now been fully vaccinated in Nigeria. A breakdown of states shows that Lagos has vaccinated 799,519 individuals with a first dose, and while another 416,732 have been fully vaccinated. Now, Lagos is followed by the likes of Ogun states, uh, Ogun Kano and Oyo states. We also have the Federal Capital Territory coming in uh, one of those top five, six states with large vaccination numbers at the moment. Let's leave Nigeria now to Zimbabwe, where the country is allowing bars to reopen for the first time in more than a year, but only for fully vaccinated people. For you to have been fully vaccinated, you must have received two doses of vaccines, although some countries like Israel now say it has to be three for you to be fully vaccinated, considering a booster jab in addition. Interestingly, while this may encourage vaccine uptake in Zimbabwe, the reason for reopening, according to the information minister in the country, is out of concern that the continued closure of licensed, bar licensed bars and nightclubs has caused not only a loss of income and unemployment in the country, but has also resulted in more shrooming of illegal outlets. Just look at that in Zimbabwe. Well, away from Africa to the U.S. very quickly, where the country understands that the, understands the importance of testing as a way of keeping the pandemic under control. Well, the Biden administration announced it will invest a further $1 billion in COVID-19 testing. This is an addition to the $2 billion already invested so far. This amount will see the U.S. have about 200 million, 200 million at-home rapid tests by December. Uh, that's four times more than they had earlier in the year. Now, the administration is also set to double its commitment to free testing by having 20,000 local pharmacies across the country offer no-charge testing through the federal government's free pharmacy testing program. Uh, it's just not vaccination. Countries must continue to test to understand the direction of 
the pandemic. And finally, a satellite TV channel has been fined £25,000 by the UK broadcast uh, watchdog for airing conspiracy theories about coronavirus. It's the third time this year. Third time this year, the Love Ward has been found to have breached broadcasting rules. And according to the regulator Ofcom, during these shows, presenters made a number of unevidenced, materially misleading, and potentially harmful statements about the coronavirus pandemic and vaccines. I'm quoting Ofcom directly uh, there. Ofcom. Let's start with Ofcom. Guys. Ofcom is the uh, broadcast regulator yeah. in the United Kingdom. Uh, although here we're very suspicious about the broadcast regulator and its methods and how the law is constantly, you know, um, you know misapplied. Uh, but in the uh, United Kingdom in Britain, you know, they seem to have uh, a more better system in terms of the application of the law. But to be specific, in this instance, what we're dealing with is infodemic. I think it was last week you brought the story about Twitter saying that, uh, you know, uh, was it Twitter or YouTube? You brought a story about YouTube, YouTube pulling down uh, over the uh, last uh, one year about uh, one million videos, 300,000 of those videos relating specifically to COVID infodemic. And then you find broadcast regulators in other parts of the world saying, look, misinformation with regard to COVID-19 can cause problems, create a deepen the global public health crisis that everyone is uh, dealing with. And you will recall this particular uh, Christian uh, network when uh, Pastor Chris Oyakilome, a Nigerian, you know, founder of the Christ Embassy, uh, you know, went ahead to say 5G uh, is the cause of uh, the pandemic and tried to make that association. Yeah, because that channel also broadcasts uh, in the United Kingdom, the matter was taken up by Ofcom. And there was an order of restraint on that particular channel, but now there's been a fine of 25,000 uh, pounds. However, what is important is that misinformation with regard to the pandemic can endanger human lives. And it's important uh, that everyone realizes that media is also about responsibility, okay? And in the context of a public health crisis, you know, a responsible media will be more useful to the development process. But here in Nigeria, we are often more concerned about the abuse of that nexus by persons in position of power, by the attempt by persons in authority to use that to restrict the scope of uh, free speech. So I think that's important. The, you know, this uh, intervention will probably restrain not just Ofcom, but similar organizations from towing the path of uh, you know, the infodemic. Now you talked about Zimbabwe. The Zim Zimbabwe is the, uh, one of those very few countries in Africa with a vaccine mandate. They have a mandate in place which says that you cannot go to places of worship, you, particularly if you have not been fully vaccinated. And in terms of achievement, uh, Zimbabwe has been able to vaccinate 15% of its 15 million population. The average in Africa, the highest average, is 4%. So in terms of the vaccination, uh, Zimbabwe has done relatively uh, better than most African countries. But what they've done now is to say, well, you can go to pubs and uh, restaurants. You know, they've lifted uh, that uh, restriction. Previously, uh, all pubs and restaurants were required to close by 7 p.m. But now it's open because they've discovered that those running pubs and uh, restaurants have gone underground. So the drinks you cannot get ordinarily, legally in stores. So you go to the, uh, you know, to the bootleg uh, wing of it and you go and get it. But the lesson should be that other African countries, you know, should concentrate on how people can be pulled out of vaccine hesitancy, encourage them to take the vaccine uh, so that uh, everyone can be safe. Because if, uh, you are not safe, then others are also not safe. And I think it's a good example. Although Zimbabwe has lorry loads of problems in other areas, in particularly in terms of quality of leadership, in terms of you know, the, uh, the management of the economy, but that's not the subject you've brought before us. So let, let me just stay with the issue about uh, COVID-19.
Well, from 1920s America to present day Zimbabwe, we can all see good luck trying to ban the consumption and sale of alcohol. People will find a way. So it's good that the government actually understands that. Rather than trying to fight a battle, they simply will not win. But I want to highlight a story, Adiswa, and I want your take on it. The fact is that about 160 artisans have been reported to have benefited from the federal government's COVID um, relief fund for MSMEs. And the money, which is 30,000 Naira, was paid into their accounts by the Bank of Industry, which is completely different from some of our poverty alleviation schemes where cash is handed to unnamed, unknown people. I'd like your take on that. Where there's a will, there is, where there's will, there is a way, isn't there? You actually want to do something productive. There is definitely to do. Uh, it might not be jollof rice or, you know. Don't Amala make me like hungry this year. <laughs> <laughs> be careful. Don't make me hungry. I'm mentioning jollof That's rice. definitely so. an incentive uh, for those who've been affected by this pandemic. And I mean, we only wish to see more of that mm. uh, to encourage not just individuals, but as, as well as businesses. And, and you know, accountability, like, like we, we discussed uh, previously on this show that we could COVID-19 pandemic, we've also seen mismanagement of funds. Mm. Uh, and, you know, so if this is being paid directly into the account, we can only hope that it's some, it, you know, there's some sort of accountability and traceability to the funds that have been spent. So it, it's a good one. Yeah. And going forward, please, if they're going to pay all of this largesse or money to people, they should just pay it into their e-Naira wallets. At least we can get a lot of accountability that way. And it's easier. <laughs> E Naira wallets. It's here for all of us. Yes. Okay. yes. Let them start with a social register and make sure that the social register is representative yes. enough and that Nigerians will not have to raise questions about equity and representation. Thank you very much, uh, Adesua. Uh, you still have an outstanding uh, implication. She oh, yeah, Dr. Abati. She does not. She yeah, does Dr. not. Yeah, that's what I want to hear. Well, you, know, you can stand it. Like tomorrow, is, tomorrow is Friday. <laughs> you can do it. I guess, uh, you can do it. I have your back. Yes. Are you doing this? This is my lookalike.